Right, so, uh, that's all right. Press the button, press the button, Max. No, nobody got him old. Anyway, um, right, so, uh, yeah, Danny started us 30 minutes late. I was hoping to break his record, but uh, not too bad. Okay, um, by the way, has this been bothering anybody else too? Like, they're not the same size. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> this is be getting me. Anyway, right, okay. Hello, uh, my name is Phoenix. Uh, I'm VP Engineering at a company called Blockchain Labs. Uh, we actually have uh, offices here in Wallington as well as in Auckland. Um, and I want to tell you today about how you can automate your integration tests using PyTest Docker Compose. So actually a couple of jobs ago, uh, I was senior blockchain architect at a company called Centrality and we were building a bespoke blockchain implementation called Plug. And the thing about uh, these kinds of systems when you have these large networks is you can get your unit test running really well. And in fact, we had close to 2,000 unit tests. But sometimes you really can only test the system by spinning up a bunch of nodes, firing real transactions at them, and seeing what happens. And we actually got quite good at that. So we had command line tools that would dynamically create these Docker uh, environments. Oh, hey, I should, there's a camera that's going to be not following me. Um, so we got pretty good. We had all these tools set up to dynamically create these different environments using Docker Compose. I had a bunch of tools that would then fire all these transactions in real time, massive volume to random nodes. And then we would kind of go through the logs and see what happened and verify if things were still working. And then when we were done, we would tear everything down and we would lose all the work we just did. And that got really annoying. So I started to look around and I thought, there's got to be a better way to do this. We have all the tools. We have Docker Compose to automate the environment setup. We have PyTest to automate running the tests. Is there a way we can, we can connect the dots? And I did some digging, and that's when I discovered that Docker Compose is actually written in Python. And so a few late nights, some caffeine, and a whole lot of cursing later, we had PyTest Docker Compose. And so I'm going to go through this with you today. So uh, here's kind of the idea. So, um, I'll just give a quick introduction to Docker, a very fast, high-level, somewhat irresponsible introduction. Um, then we'll do what I hope will be the meat of this presentation, which is a big, hairy demo of the whole thing in action. Uh, then I want to talk a little bit about the uh, open source project itself. Then we'll do some Q&A, and then it will be time for dinner. Sound good? All right. So, real quick, um, can I just get a show of hands, fist of five, uh, where zero or one is I've literally never heard of Docker until just now, Four or five is I could totally be down here giving that presentation. I won't hold you to it, but uh, fist of five, how do you feel about Docker? How comfortable are you? Okay, so we actually do have a pretty good mix. Um, that's actually good to see. Um, cool. So for those of you that were one or two or three, um, again, this will be a very high level overview. I'll have a few URLs scattered throughout where you can get more information to get a little bit deeper. And for those of you that gave a four or five, just correct me if I screw anything up. So. In the early 2000s, when I was a teenager, um, I, had, I, I grew up in an Apple household. So we had uh, a couple of Apple computers. Um, but I was kind of a gamer. And at the time, because that's totally been fixed by now, um, at the time, nobody made any cool games for Mac. Um, but I came across this program called VMware Fusion. And you could literally, through this, you would open up a window. And in the window would be a Windows desktop. And you could install programs, and you could play games, because that's all I ever did with it. Um, and you could go into control panel and mess with display settings. Like, it literally was like having an, another computer inside of your computer. And even better, VMware Fusion lets you open as many windows as your physical hardware could stand. This is early 2000, so like two. But, uh, <laughs> right? And so literally, it looks kind of like this. So here we have the physical infrastructure on the bottom. I'm not cool enough to get the laser pointer, so the physical infrastructure on the bottom. Uh, running on top of that is what's called the hypervisor. So you can think of the hypervisor to the, the virtual machines, what your operating system is to your user land applications. So it kind of acts as the layer so that you don't have to worry about, or your applications don't have to worry about, oh, how do I access the hardware? Uh, the hypervisor would do that for you. And then sitting on top of that is each of the different virtual machines. And you can see that each virtual machine has its own guest operating system. So if you're playing games in Windows, uh, was it XP back then? Probably was. Uh, if you're playing games in Windows XP, then literally there is a copy of Windows XP running inside of that virtual machine. And if you want to have multiple virtual machines, each one has its own copy of an operating system. And so naturally, that's pretty much where all of your RAM is going to go. 
Now, to be fair, that's not a knock against virtual machines because quite frankly, thank goodness for virtual machines, this is kind of how cloud computing works. Um, but from the perspective of a developer who's got a single work laptop and really all you need to do is set up like a, a database and an app server, this is probably a bit overkill. And so this is one of the problems that containers addresses. And so containers looks a bit more like this. So you still have your physical hardware uh, and then the host operating system running on top of it. So this is kind of running just in line with as uh, any other application running on your system. Uh, Docker then acts kind of as the hypervisor, if you will, um, for those containers. And what's cool about that is the containers are essentially all sharing the same operating system or the same kernel and system resources. So each container is now fairly minimal. It's just dedicated to running a particular application or a server or a service. And so it's much more lightweight and it's much more efficient for running a bunch of systems on your local machine. So that is, as I said, the very high level irresponsible introduction to Docker. Um, I will go into some of those concepts in a bit more detail during the demo, but just the idea so that you understand is what we're gonna be doing is literally, we're going to be spinning up a couple of services inside of containers that are all gonna be running on this laptop. Yes, sir, we have a question already. Described maybe 10, 12 times, and that was the best description of my Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, so, just to repeat the question. Uh, <laughs> right. So, let's do the Big Harry demo. So, this is going to be um, a modified version of the Getting Started tutorial from the Docker website. So if you do want to maybe not follow along, but if you do want to try this on your own at some point, you can go to that URL. Um, okay, I have a small uh, confession to make. So the demo was going to be um, a Flask application that connects to Redis and has these two endpoints. But after I saw Amber's presentation, I thought, could I slide Klein into that? And so over my lunch break, I very irresponsibly hacked together a new version of the demo that uses Klein. So we're gonna see if it works. Uh, if I'm not taking a risk, I'm not doing it right. So uh, we'll have a client application, but for those of you that don't know, so Flask is a web application framework. It's very similar in concept to Django or Pyramid. Uh, Flask is generally considered to be sort of more of a lightweight uh, uh, application framework. Um, and Klein uh, uses Twisted internally, and so it's designed more for asynchronous applications. Cool stuff. Um, we're going to expose two different endpoints. Ooh, do I have a, cur oh, I have a cursor? Who needs a laser pointer? Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna expose two endpoints. So we have um, a home page. you go to slash, and we get a little greeting. Uh, it's gonna display the host name of the system, and then a visitor counter circa early 2000s, because I really never grew up. And then the other endpoint is gonna be a health check. Uh, all it does is return OK, and that will become important towards the end of the demo. And then powering the visitor counter is a Redis uh, database. So for those of you that don't know, and what the heck for those of you that do, Redis is basically a key value storage. So as opposed to like a traditional SQL database, with Redis it's more about here's a key and there's a value associated with that key and it's just a gigantic list of keys. Um, that is a very irresponsible way to explain it, but here we are. Um, so yeah, so big, big, hairy, who did that? <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a reputation around the office. Those of you who have seen my motorcycle helmet, you'll understand. Um, those of you who don't, that makes no sense. Um, so here's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna deploy this application using Docker and we'll just kind of see what that takes. Uh, then we're gonna do it way faster with Docker Compose. We'll then take a look at some unit tests and then finally we'll bring it all together with PyTest Docker Compose. And all the code that you're gonna see is actually at this GitHub repository right here. And the code is all fully commented and documented and uh, has all the instructions as well. So basically everything you're gonna see me do, you could actually go through and do it again yourself back at home if you wanted. Um, and I will have a link to the presentation. So for those of you that are furiously scribbling things down, there we go, almost. Uh, now, now like the one guy who doesn't see me looking at him. Anyway, okay, whoops, that's a spoiler. Okay, so let's, let's dive in. And let's dive in not on my screen, but actually up, ooh, I did not know I could do that. Cool, learned something today. Right, so. Here I have a, an app, uh, a simple Klein application, woohoo. Um, so here's our first route, this is our home page. And so you can see we're gonna show a greeting, uh, we're gonna show a host name and a visit counter. We'll dive into that in a little more detail in a second. And over here is our health check endpoint, and that returns okay. 
And then when we run the app, we're going to do two things. So we're going to set up a connection to a Redis server, um, and we're going to use Redis as the host name that we're going to connect to. So if we were doing this on our local development environment, we might run Redis locally, and so this would be localhost. Um, but we kind of want to mimic. The idea behind this is by using containers, we can literally spin up the entire production uh, environment on our local machine. So let's try to get this to behave just like the production environment. In a production environment, we wouldn't run the Redis server on the same hardware as the, uh, as the application server. So why would we do it during development, right? Works on my machine, right? Um, and yes, you can, you can adjust that with environment variables or settings files, but this is a demo. Um, and then the other piece is we're going to actually run the web server. It's going to listen on basically all traffic coming in on port 80. And so let's just take a look and see what this looks like. Um, let's take, there it is. Okay, so here I am inside of my project directory. And so here's that app.py that we were just looking at. And if I Python app.py, here we go. Okay, cool. So it has now started the web server. And if we then come over to here and we, oh, sorry. So before I came to New Zealand, I was living in South America for about four years. And my Spanish is nowhere near as good as it really ought to be, considering I was there for four years. So this is kind of my attempt to not get too rusty. I have set my system language to Spanish. So just fair, fair enough. Um, so if we drop over here to localhost, I'm actually surprised that worked. I didn't realize. I could have sworn that you had to be root to bind to port 1024 or less, but fair enough. Um, and so here we are. So we have hello world. I'll show you that in a second. Host name, phxlabsnewzealand.local, because I'm thoroughly uncreative. And we can't connect to Redis because it's not running yet. Um, cool. So that's working, just to verify that the app works. And that world part, so when we show the greeting up here, um, we do hello name. And name comes from uh, environment variable. So if there's a, a name environment variable set, we'll use that. And if not, we'll just use world as the default. So sure enough. If I come over here and I shut that down, and we do it again, but we set an, an environment variable before we start, so name equals maybe kiwi pi con x, because again, I'm thoroughly uncreative. And now we come back over here, and we run this, and now we get our hello kiwi pi con x. Cool. All right, hold your applause, please. <laughs> so let's have some fun now. Let's, let's actually spin this up in a Docker container. So any project that uses Docker, you're going to find this thing called a Docker file. And the Docker file, so if you've ever heard the phrase infrastructure as code, that is basically what this Docker file is, is it has the instructions that we need to create a container that's going to have the app running inside of it. And so every uh, Docker file starts with the same kind of construct. It has a from. So it'll be from and then the name of some other image. Or if you're literally starting from scratch, it will be from scratch. Very cute. Um, in this case, we're doing from Python 3.6. Uh, yes, thank you. Go away, please. Thank you. Um, from Python 3.6 Alpine. So just like how Python has PyPy, and you can install pretty much anything under the sun using pip, Docker has Docker Hub. And so if we come over here and we go to hub.docker.com, now that's cool, we'll wait, there we go. We search for Python, here we go. And so this is actually even an official Docker image. And if we look for, it was Alpine, it was 3.6 dash Alpine, there it is, cool. And so if we actually click through to this, we even see that this itself is based on another Docker file. And this one uses Alpine as the source image. So Alpine you can think of as a very, very minimal Linux installation. Um, it, all told, it's like something like five megabytes in size. Again, your system, your host operating system provides the kernel. So all of that is provided by your host. So everything on top of that is very, very small. And then what we're doing is we're taking that very minimal Alpine installation, and then we're putting Python and pip on top of it. And this is the source code. So we're actually, I've already downloaded the pre-compiled binary, if you will. But you can download this yourself and build the image yourself if you ever wanted to. Um, but we don't have the time for that. So instead, um, we're going to drop over here. So we're going to use that one as our source. So you can think of this literally like pr provisioning a computer that only has Linux and Python installed on it. Because that's all we need for this container. We're then going to, OK, so this is the one part of the demo that uh, might be a little, might not work as well. To install Twisted, we do have to do some compilation. So we're going to run this command inside of the container. So once we have Python, we then have to install G++. We're then going to create a directory called app. We're going to copy everything from our project directory, so everything in here, into that directory on the container. So copy all our project files over. We're then going to run a pip install inside the container to install all the dependencies. 
We'll then set that name environment variable. So instead of hello Kiwi PyCon X, it's going to say hello Docker when we load the web page. Uh, we're then going to, this is more for documentation, but basically indicate that we're going to be exposing a service on port 80 from the container, right? So that's our web server. And then finally, we're going to tell Docker, once the container starts, I want you to run this command. So Python app.py, same command that we were running in the terminal before. And so to make this all work, so we're going to Docker build. Uh, then we'll do dash T, so we're going to give it uh, what's called a tag. And we'll call it hello py test docker compose. That's too much typing. PDC will be fine. And then we give it a context, which is the current directory. So basically, we're going to run the, the, uh, the, the Docker build in the context of this directory, mainly so that, for example, when we do our copy, we're actually copying all the files from the correct directory. And so we're going to run that. And off it goes. And so you can kind of see already it's actually running exactly the same commands. So it starts with our source image. Here we go. Um, it's going to install G++. That might take a minute or two. Um, no, not as long as I thought. That's a good sign, or a bad sign. Can you increase the size of the font, please? Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Good. All right, cool. Or, or if not, just look at that one. It's a little bit bigger. Um, <laughs> OK, cool. And so now you can see it is running. Um, a pip install directly inside the container. So you can see, since it's not going to copy all of the stuff that I've installed on my local system, it is actually going to download all of these from pip, uh, from PyPy, excuse me, um, run environment name, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so it successfully built our container. Uh, sorry, it successfully built our image, and it tagged it with Hello PDC latest. So technically, Hello PDC is the repository, and latest is the version. Um, but this does let you version your images as well. So this could be Hello PDC 1.0. And so sure enough, if I do a Docker image ls, it now shows that here's my Hello PDC, um, has an image ID here, F882A, and so on, created 29 seconds ago and counting. 300 megabytes, so you want to keep track of that. Um, and you can see that here we have Python. Here's our Python 3.6 Alpine, which I very wisely downloaded three weeks ago, um, just so that I could then hack together the demo a few hours ago. Um, I plan these things. Um, and notice also that as we're going through, that it's also giving us these other hashes as well. So after we ran, so after we installed all those Python, uh, all those Python modules, we got this hash here, E209F5. So if I actually do a Docker image ls-a, and I see all of my intermediate, contain, uh, intermediate images, and here it is here, right? And also takes up 300 megabytes. So one command and one, two, three, over a gigabyte is already gone. Um, thank goodness 2019, and we don't have to worry about that anymore. So what's nice about that is if I try to rebuild that Docker image, and you can see using cache. So whenever it can, it's going to use those cached images. And basically, unless I change one of my code files, right, that would invalidate the cache for this step, and then everything after it would have to be rerun. But essentially now, I never have to install G++ on this image ever again. Handy. All right, enough of that. So now let's get this thing running. Now the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to um, do something a little bit unusual. So we're going to have two containers running. One's going to have our app. One's going to have Redis. And we do want them to be able to talk to each other. Now, by default, Docker images kind of run more or less in isolation, not just from the host environment, but also from each other. So if we want the, the app to be able to talk to Redis on port 6379, then we need to make sure that they're running on the same virtual network as well. Fortunately, that's actually quite simple to do. So we're going to do a Docker network create, and we're just going to call it hello PDC net. Going with that theme of being very creative. I won't go too much into what that does, um, but we'll, you'll see how, how we use it. So now the fun part. So Docker run. So we're going to run an image, uh, dash dash rm. So once the container's done running, remove it. Just save a little disk space at the end. Um, dash dash name. Let's give it a name. We'll call it app. Uh, let's attach the hello, the hello, hello PDC net network. Uh, we'll then detach it. So this is kind of the same idea as putting an ampersand at the end of a command, so to kind of run it in the background. Uh, otherwise, Docker would take control over the terminal and just stream standard out to the terminal, which would be handy, but I want to keep control of the terminal right now. Then we're going to do some port mappings. So the network is important so that the different Docker containers can talk to each other, but also we want to be able to access port 80 on the container from our local system. So I want to be able to go to localhost on my local system and see our website. And I'm going to, just for variety, I'm going to map it to port 5000, because localhost 5000 sounds cool to me. Um, that's really the only reason. Um, 
And then lastly, the name of our image, hello PDC. And if we wanted to, we could do hello PDC.latest, but Docker adds that automatically. We do that, we get this nice long thing. So now if I do Docker container ls, we now have a running container. And here's our container ID, 9DA9 blah blah blah, that's this thing right here, uh, 9DA98, yep. Um, here's our image, hello PDC. Here's the command it's running, python app.py, created seven seconds ago, blah, blah, blah. And you can see here we've mapped port 80 from the container to localhost 5000. And so if we come over here and we localhost 5000, there it is, hello Docker. And here's our host name, 9DA98. So basically it used the container ID as the host name. Um, but we still can't connect to Redis because we don't have a Redis container up and running yet. So we'll do that next. So for that one, so when I, when I did Docker, some of, some of you may have noticed this. Um, I also downloaded uh, Redi uh, Redis three weeks ago. So I have a Redis Alpine image. So again, this is a very minimal Linux installation with, with Redis installed on top of it. You'll also see that I downloaded Node because this is my work laptop and I've had to do some stuff in Node. Never mind. Um, I guess it's only 75 megabytes. I could have deleted it. Oh well. Um, so since we've already downloaded the image, we don't have to build anything. So again, we'll just do a Docker run and again a dash dash rm. We'll, this time we'll call this one Redis. And this name actually is very important. So if we go back over to our code really quickly, not that code, this code. Um, down here when we were setting up the Redis connection, we used Redis as the host name of the Redis uh, server, which now that I think about it is slightly confusing, but here we are. Um, and so the idea is that this name essentially needs to match the name we give to our image because Docker will actually use this as one of the host aliases for that container. Because otherwise we'd have to guess what that container hash is gonna be and I don't feel like doing that today. Uh, next thing we do is, I'm totally cribbing off my notes here. Oh right, so we have to attach the network, so hello PDC net. And again, we're going to detach, and then finally Redis Alpine. So we do that. We get another uh, hash. And so if I docker uh, container, uh, container, contain, my first language is American, bear with me. There we go. Uh, ls, cool, so now we have two images running. So here's our hello PDC, running Python app.py. Here's Redis Alpine running God knows what. And Notice that the Docker container here is exposing a service on port 6379, so that is accessible to other Docker containers running on the same network, but we didn't map it to any ports locally, so we can't access it, which is just fine. And so sure enough, if I come over here, okay, hold your breath. There it is, all right. All right, cool, so that was fun. Now let's, let's tear that all down. Okay, so we got this running, woohoo, great, wonderful. Um, but that was a lot of work, right? There was a bunch of commands that we ran in there, and also there were a lot of switches and flags and configuration options. So clearly, we need, we need to do something more because I can't, like, I could put that all into a shell script or something, but that's not really very easy to automate. And so that's where Docker, com Docker Compose comes into play. So just like how Docker uses a Docker file for instructions on what to do, Docker Compose uses a docker-compose.yaml. And so as the name suggests, this is a YAML file. Uh, we define our services here. So again, we're gonna have two services, the app and the Redis, as it were. Um, the app we're actually gonna build from scratch because you know that's our application. So anytime we make a code change, we wanna rebuild that image uh, and rerun the container. And we are gonna tell it again to map port 5000 locally to port 80 on the container. And then for Redis, we're just gonna use that stock image, Redis Alpine, and we don't need to map any ports for that. This is a very, very uh, small, very simple Docker Compose. Some of them can get quite elaborate. There's actually a lot you can do with this. But again, this demo is about PyTest Docker Compose, which technically I haven't even talked about yet. So let's move on. So now that we have all the instructions for how to run the containers and map ports and all that, to get this all running, we do docker-compose, com compese, that could be Portuguese, uh, compose, up. Now. Docker Compose is now going to set about now, because Docker Compose uses a slightly different naming convention for tags and things like that, it's going to assume that it hasn't actually built anything yet. So it is gonna go back and rebuild everything, but notice how it didn't have to reinstall G++. It could still use the cached image for that, um, but it did need to rebuild the application itself. Cool, and now it's running. 
And so Docker Compose very helpfully takes the standard out from each of the containers and streams it to my terminal, and it even is very polite, and it, and it labels them. So the Redis 1, which gets light blue, and app, which gets yellow. I didn't pick those colors, but it works. And so in theory, this should just work. There we go. Cool. And so it got a new host name this time because the container ID changed, um, but everything works as expected. So one command, a lot easier. So now I think we're getting close to that whole infrastructure as code thing we've all heard so much about. So I'm going to control C and stop this. Cool, cool. And in incidentally, this will become important later, if I bring it back up, notice it didn't have to rebuild anything. And in fact, the app just picks right up where it left off. So that visitor counter never reset. If I were to bring these down and then also do a Docker Compose down, and this actually removes those containers, now if I bring it back up, it starts over. So that will become important once we finally get to PyTest Docker Compose that you've heard so much about. But before we do that, um, I want to talk a little bit about PyTest. So briefly, a uh, quick show of hands. Um, how many of you are familiar with or have used PyTest? Oh, all right. I'm actually quite pleasantly surprised by that. Very cool. Has anyone here worked with uh, unit tests, nose tests, uh, JUnit, PHP unit, like class base? OK, cool. So actually, probably the same people. Great. Um, that makes it a little bit easier. So for those of you watching at home, um, I'm going to annoy everybody in the audience. Um, so PyTest is a unit testing framework for Python. Um, and so if I come over here, whoops, nope, we're not there yet. We're here. Um, I was somewhat responsible. I did you know, run through some of this beforehand. So you're seeing a few artifacts. Here we go. Um, so if I, if, I look at the, uh, if I look at the app code here, we have this function increment counter. And so when we visit the home page, we're going to call increment counter and pass in our Redis connection. And we expect that to return some number. And if it doesn't, then we get this little cannot connect to Redis counter disabled. And that's what we put down here. And so increment counter takes a Redis client object and it returns an integer. And basically all it's going to do is it's going to call Redis client uh, incur and pass in a key counter. So for those of you that don't know Redis or who don't mind being reminded, uh, the incur function uh, looks for a key matching that name, so counter. And it's going to increment it atomically and return the new value. So if it doesn't exist, it will just set it to 0, increment it to 1, and return the 1. If it's set to some other number, to 41, then it'll increment it to 42 and return that value. Um, and if there's any kind of a problem, then it will just return 0. Not the most responsible way to do this, but again, this is a demo, so I don't care. Um, and so now over here in our unit tests, we have our counter test. And so we have two tests. So for those of you who are familiar with uh, nose tests and unit tests and all these other class-based frameworks, we're used to thinking in terms of one class being a test case, uh, and then each of the methods on that class are individual tests. And PyTest just says, well, really, the module can be the test case, and each function can be an individual test. So it's just a slightly different way of approaching it, but it works. And so, oh, I should say also, by the way, so for any of you who don't know PyTest, so like none of you, just folks watching at home, um, this is going to be an extraordinarily irresponsible introduction to PyTest. Um, I am going to show you tests that are both uh, way too trivial and way too complicated to be very good uh, starting points. I'm really just doing this so I have a nice bridge to PyTest Docker Compose and so I can build a little more suspense. Um, so just bear that in mind, what I'm about to show you. If you're confused by any of this part, that is 100% my fault and it's kind of on purpose. So. Um, because increment counter is interacting with Redis, we have a bit of a challenge because we don't really want to set up a Redis server while these unit tests are running. That's a lot of extra overhead. Plus, we want to have two, two tests, one for the happy path, but also one for what happens if, the, if Redis throws an exception. And trying to get a healthy Redis instance to throw an exception uh, during unit test is it's, it's tricky, to say the least. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to mock it. So PyTest has this concept of fixtures, and that's what these things are here, this monkey patch, and then this Redis client here. So when a test is running, PyTest does a little bit of reflection, and it's going to check to see, OK, what are these? So I have a monkey patch, and I have a Redis client. And it is going to look for matching fixtures to find in the tests. So monkey patch, we actually get that for free. PyTest comes built with it. But then this Redis client, so if I come over here to this file called conftest.py, um, this threw me because I hate that name, but you have to use it. Um, so over here, I've defined a fixture, and I've called it Redis client. And so in our tests, wherever we see Redis client as one of the parameters to a test, PyTest is just going to run that, uh, this function here, and whatever this returns, that will be the value it assigns to that argument. Um, and by the way, for those of you who are seeing this and say, I don't like this, I know a lot of developers like to do this. That also works. 
Um, I do this um, mostly so that way if I'm looking for my fixtures, uh, I can see them all. Anyway, there you go, my opinion. I have the podium, yeah, nana boo boo. Um, <laughs> okay, so we're gonna take our Redis client and we're just gonna monkey patch it. So we're gonna, instead of the normal increment function, we don't want it to actually try to hit Redis. Instead of what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna monkey patch it. And so whenever we try to increment, instead of calling the real increment function, it's gonna call this mock increment instead, which just in this case returns 42. And so for this test, when we call increment counter and we pass in our monkey patched Redis client, we would expect it to return 42. Right, and we're just using regular old Python asserts, so no fancy assert equal, assert this, this, that, what have you. Um, PyTest is just trying to keep it simple there. Um, but as you'll see, it actually is quite powerful, which I'll show you in a sec. For our failure test, um, we're gonna do the same thing, but instead of returning 42, it's gonna raise a timeout error, right? So to run these tests, we come over here into our project, and when you install PyTest through pip, you get access to this magical command called PyTest, and it just runs your tests for you. Sure enough, two tests. Here's our counter tests.py. Both of them passed. Very good. Um, if I were to go in as a developer and say, wait a minute, actually, my feature says that zero could be a, a valid counter value. So I'm going to make that return minus one when an error occurs. If I rerun my tests, sure enough, it catches it. And not only does it tell me where the, what test failed, but it tells me what the values were. So I got minus one. I expected zero. And here's how we got minus one. So this actually gets quite elaborate. It can really help you to tra track down the source of issues. Um, let me just fix, unvandalize my code there. Cool. And that's the cool thing about automated tests, right? I don't need to tell any of you guys because you all are familiar with this. All right, PyTest Docker Compose, let's do it. So that's all fine and good. We have these lovely unit tests, but how do we actually know that this app is going to work? Like when we stand this up and we go to the home page, how do we actually know that this is going to work and it's going to connect to Redis and do all of that stuff, right? And yeah, we could load it up in a browser, but again, we want this to be automated. And so that's where PyTest Docker Compose comes into play. So here we have our integration tests, and we have a home page test. So we're going to load the home page, and we're going to check that counter. So you see here we have two tests. We also are activating the PyTest Docker Compose plugin. Um, this can get a bit heavy depending upon how uh, uh, elaborate your images are. So it is an opt-in. Um, these tests take a home page fixture. We'll look at that in a second. But you can see here, so we're going to send a get request to the home page uh, using the request library. We're going to get the HTML as text, and we're going to check to see that it ends with visits one. So far, so good. And then if we send another request, we would expect the counter to be increased. Easy peasy. This test here, we're going to do the same thing, but notice that when we send another request in this test, the counter has been reset. So this is not really a test for the application, but it is just to show you that PyTest Docker Compose, by default, will tear down your containers and rerun them in between each test. So let's give that a go. So because these do not run by default, I have to explicitly tell PyTest I want to run my integration tests, home page test. And this might take a few seconds. So while we're doing that, let's look at this home page fixture. So again, uh, PyTest is going to look for a fixture called home page in this conf test.py. Here it is. So here's the name home page. And what's cool is PyTest fixtures can also use other PyTest fixtures. So here we have one provided by PyTest Docker Compose called function scoped container getter. I did have a discussion with the other developer maintaining this project. I actually wanted to make them shorter. We ended up making the name longer. That'll teach me. Um, but function scope container getter, as the name implies, is it gets you access to the Docker containers that are running during your test. And so sure enough here, we're going to get access to our service. So we do fscp or fscg uh, dot get app. So this matches the name of the service in your Docker Compose YAML, which PyTest Docker Compose essentially is reading. Um, so we want to get access to the app because we do want to send requests to the website to see the result. Um, and then we get its network info. So the PyTest Docker Compose will then attach an array or a list of these network info objects to each container. And so for each port that we are exposing through our Docker Compose.yaml, it's going to attach a network info object. The idea there just being that I don't want to have to hard code 5,000 in my fixture because if I do need to change this, this doesn't actually have anything to do with the application, right? Everything on the container hasn't changed. So our test should still pass regardless of what we're, put, what we're binding it to locally. Um, and so sure enough, this gives us a way of finding the host name and the host port that we should be sending requests to to test our application. Uh, then we hit this health check endpoint. So, um, Docker Compose doesn't actually know what's running on the containers. So Docker Compose will say, great, your container's up and running. I've run the py Python app.py uh, command. Here you go. But meanwhile, um, 
the client application or the Flask application hasn't actually finished initializing yet. It's not ready to accept HTTP requests yet. And so what we're doing here is we're just gonna send a request to that health check endpoint and just check to see that we get an okay response. And we'll retry up to five times with a back off of a fraction of a second. So we're just giving the container just a couple extra milli uh, fractions of a second to come online and be ready to accept requests. And once we finally get that okay response from our health check, then we return the base URL, which means now that our test, which uses that fixture, can now send get requests to that URL. And so, if I got this all right, here we go. There it is, all right. So everything worked. And if we were to go in and change something, so let's go over to our app.py and let's say somehow, for some reason, this got changed from a variable to the number one, right? Now if I come in here and I run the unit tests, the unit tests still pass because I never modified that increment counter function. So if all I was doing was running the unit tests, I would think that my app is still running. But if I run the integration tests, and this will take a few seconds, um, what we'll see ideally is that one of these tests is going to fail. Does anybody have a question that will take 28 seconds or less to answer? <laughs> so far so good, I like it. Um, while that's running, um, I'm just gonna ju jump back into, no, not this, uh, this, no, not this. Oh, that's right, I have to do this. So, I grew up with Max, I'm not used to this stuff. Um, right, so uh, look at these two uh, handsome gentlemen on the screen now. Uh, so I did originally create PyTest Docker Compose, but I do also need to give a huge shout out to Rold Storm. Uh, Rold actually has now taken over the project as the lead. He has done some amazing work with it. He's added a whole bunch of new features. So one of the reasons why that fixture had that ridiculously long name, Function Scoped Container Getter, is because uh, that fixture by default is torn down and rebuilt after every test, but if you have a very elaborate setup and you need your fixtures or your, uh, your containers to stay around for longer, so to keep them up throughout the whole test run or for the single module, he's created additional fixtures that you can use to help speed things up. He's also even written unit tests for this project, which is frankly amazing. Um, so just massive, massive props to this gentleman. Um, and it's been 28 seconds. It has, good. So as you can see, we have our one failed and our one passed. And so sure enough, not only did we get our failure message, so we tried to check to see that the text we got from the home page ends with visits to, um, but we can see here that, and so PyTest will actually unpack all of it. So what we actually got was hello, hello Docker, host name, uh, ends with, uh, sorry, visits one. So we know that this was incorrect. And it even shows us here's the URL that we tried to hit. Cool stuff. But also PyTest Docker Compose captured all of the output from when it was building the containers, from when it was setting up the tests during runtime, so we can see all of the different requests that were made to, uh, to our app. And you can even see here when we were setting up. So actually, that test almost failed because we had to retry four times to hit that health check endpoint before we got that okay. Um, and you can see that's when, when we finally got it, and then here are our two requests to the homepage. So PyTest Docker Compose is trying to give you as much information as possible, maybe even too much. Literally yesterday morning, there was a pull request. Uh, somebody wanted to turn that off. Um, fair enough. Um, but literally, we're just trying to give you as much information as possible that you can use to figure out why that test failed. Um, and so I want to just finish things up um, with my employer-mandated slide. So. Um, here at Blockchain Labs, um, we love technology like this. We love pushing the envelope, going to the cutting edge. Um, last week, I was really excited because I found a way to install a package from a private GitHub repository into a Docker image without having to store SSH keys onto it. I hope that made sense to somebody. I was really happy with myself. Um, we love cutting edge stuff like this. We have some stuff that we're building uh, that is actually based around blockchain that's gonna be really exciting. So with a little luck, uh, I'll get to show this off to you uh, at KiwiPyCon XI11 uh, next year. So thank you so much for your time. Um, that, URL, that URL there goes to this presentation. Um, so if you missed any URLs or if you just wanted to see my happy smiling face again, um, it is there for you. Um, and also I've turned on comments. So if you have questions or anything afterwards, uh, feel free to tag stuff, ask questions, leave comments, what have you. So thanks so much. At this point, uh, let's take some questions. I know I am literally what's standing between you and food right now. Just keep that in mind. Cool. Yes, go for it. Okay. So the, the question is, uh, so when I, was, when I was setting everything up using Docker, I did have to create a network. But when I used Docker Compose, there was no mention of network in there. Is that what you're asking about? Okay. So what's really cool um, is Docker Compose basically does that for you automatically by default. 
And so um, if we come, I can probably see it, see it in here somewhere. Let's see. Um, maybe not. Um, let's just do this. Yep. So when we do a Docker Compose up, the very first thing it does is it actually creates a network for uh, the containers that it's going to run. Cool. Anybody else? Oh, sorry. Yes, in the front. One, two, okay. So great presentation, thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, I'm just wondering, you have built a TDD environment, so are you going to uh, deploy in the CI, CD pipeline or something like that? Do you have any recommendation for those, uh, for that platform or pipeline for your Docker Compose and test-driven environment? Yeah, so if we wanted to integrate this into a CI or CD pipeline, um, we do have a couple of options. So we actually could. We actually could have our CI, uh, our CI server run the integration test for us. Oh, I should also fix this just in case. Um, let's just undo my vandalization of my own code there. There we go. Let's have it running. Um, I, so and actually, this might actually run really quickly because everything should be cached. So um, we actually could have our CI uh, tool run this for us. That actually is a perfectly acceptable way to do it. Um, that said, um, because we're running everything using Docker Compose, um, internally, that might be a little bit of extra overhead that carries along. So, for example, well, actually, the unit tests for this plugin, they have to use Docker Compose because it's testing the plugin. Um, but in some cases, you may actually want to just spin up Docker Compose uh, itself and then run the test through an external script. Or, um, like, you could have PyTest but configure it to send the request to some other URL other than what's being exposed by the Docker containers. So you could actually, the same way, same way we did here where I bound everything to localhost 5000 in Docker Compose, you could run those containers in, in, in uh, your CI solution, and then you could run your unit tests just hitting lo localhost 5000. Either approach would work. Hope that answered it. Hope it answered it well. No, it didn't answer it well, but hope it answered it. <laughs> cool. So I've, I've answered all the, all the possible questions you could come up with, or, or you're just really hungry, um, and you're very smart. Cool. Thanks so much for your time, guys. Hope you, hope you all enjoyed this.